Hello, welcome everybody. Welcome to Science on Tap. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, you guys may not realize this, but this is our sixth anniversary tonight. So we've been going for six years, pretty cool. Yep. So anyway, so that's uh, great, and it's all thanks to you. Thank you for um, being such loyal audience members, and we really appreciate everybody that, that comes. Um, my name is Susan Knight. I work at UW Trout Lake Station up the road about 10 miles or so, and Science on Tap is an example of the Wisconsin idea, an idea formed way back in the um, 1905 that the boundaries of the university are the boundaries of the state. So we try and get um, all the, the great research that's being done on the university or University of Minnesota all around um, up here to the North Woods. And you all know that at Science on Tap, you, you get a, um, an introduction and are an opportunity to ask questions and not so much a lecture. So it's a great opportunity to ask all the questions that you had about a certain topic. Um, remind you about our uh, um, sponsors. We work with the UW Trout Lake Station, UW Kemp Natural Resources Station, uh, the Minocqua Public Library, and the Lakeland Badger Chapter, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and of course our hosts here uh, at the Minocqua Brewing Company, so thanks to everybody. And we are funded by a grant from the, uh, the Brittingham Fund, a fund on the UW campus. So, and uh, another uh, reminder, I think you guys all know this, but uh, for we have many ways to watch this. You can watch right here as you are right now. We also have live streaming um, at the Monaco Public Library every month. And we also have live video streaming for anybody with a fast enough internet connection uh, to watch from the comfort of their own home. And we often have uh, um, it streaming from the Eagle River Library. So um, lots of ways to watch it. And then if you miss the event itself, you can always watch an event later. We, have, um, we archive all of our um, programs so that um, in a little while, they'll be available on our website, um, Science on Tap Minocqua. And a little after that, usually about a month or two down the line, uh, there will be an eight-minute short. And you can watch all of those um, short versions, a little bit of the intro, a few of the questions, uh, just to get a flavor of what the event was like. So hope that you get over to our website and talk about that. Um, our next Science on Tap event will be March 6th, and our speaker will be, oh, sorry, never mind, that, <laughs> that just got canceled, so I have to, um, we do not know who our next month's speaker is, but it'll be great, I promise. <laughs> um, and uh, we are working with, uh, we've got a couple of people in mind, um, so uh, I, I know one of them will step forward, um, some more local DNR folks, so hopefully uh, we will... Um, we will have a great speaker, and of course, watch your email so that you can uh, find out what it is. It'll be a big surprise. So <laughs> that's kind of funny. I knew for a couple of days that this fellow wasn't going to come, but hopefully he will come again another time. Another thing that is not a Science on ta Tap event, but is a science event coming up that I thought everybody might be interested in is this Saturday night at 7 o'clock, it's uh, the Mercer Community Library, just up the road, about 30 miles or so. John Magnuson, who has spoken here at Science on Tap and is a former director of the Center for Limnology, uh, Limnologist, he is going to talk about what does lake ice seasonality tell us. And he has done a tremendous amount of work looking at the duration of lake ice, how when it comes on, when it goes off, and with global warming and global climate change, that duration in many, many parts of the world has been declining quite rapidly. Uh, very obvious in um, Lake Mendota, for example. So anyway, um, 7 p.m., Mercer Community Library. Um, that will be a great event with John Magnuson. Okay, so tonight we have Dr. Malika Nako talking about high-capacity wells and water and agriculture. Dr. Nako grew up in Woodbury, Minnesota, a St. Paul suburb. And I always ask our speakers how they got interested in the subject. And I have never heard such a circuitous path to how she got to where she is today. So pay attention. There will be a quiz. Okay. So she loved to read. 
um, and she attended University of Minnesota and earned a degree in comparative literature and philosophy. She also loves public speaking, and this led to a spot on their university mock trial team. Her public speaking skills led her to a position in sales at a pharmaceutical company in Madison. In her spare time, she started gardening. And uh, this led her to become a master gardener. And one of the classes she took as a master gardener was a class in soils. And this uh, led her to earning a master's degree in soil science. And this led her to the central Wisconsin where the Little Plover River had gone dry. And this led her to classes in environmental biophysics and studying the central sands water issues. In the end, this led to a PhD in environmental and natural resources in 2017 from University of Wisconsin-Madison, studying agriculture and biophysics. Phew. <laughs> yeah, I deserve credit just for getting through all that. It's pretty amazing. So she is now a David H. Smith Conservation Research Fellow in the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. Um, and she's going to talk about uh, irrigated agriculture. It's one of Wisconsin's greatest environmental challenges. Dr. Nako is concerned about the degradation of trout streams, lakes, and wetlands, all important to all of us as well, associated with heavy groundwater withdrawals. Her research looks at the impacts of irrigated agriculture on water quantity, water quality, and climate. She looks at the problem from many different angles to help find solutions to the many demands for water. Okay, here's your trivia question for Dr. Nako. One day, she was doing her field work out in a cornfield at the crack of dawn. To do her work, she uses a tool that looks very much like a magic wand. That'll be important later. Because she was working on the corn cornfield at dawn, she got totally soaked from all the dew that was on the corn. She decided to change her into dry clothes. She had dry clothes in her car. Um, but her car happens to have a weather station on top. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these, but it's very bizarre things. You know, they get those little helicopter things going around on top. And just as she was changing, a fuel truck for the farm came lumbering by to fuel up some farm equipment, and she jumped behind her vehicle to hide from the truck driver. So here she was, practically naked, with her magic wand and this funny Ghostbusters-looking car. And as she was leaving, the fuel truck driver asked her, I have just got to ask, what the heck are you doing out here? So what did she answer? A, she said, science. B, investigating crop circles. Or C, changing into my scarecrow costume. She said science. <laughs> Dr. Go. Hello, everyone. Oh, the mic is on. I'm going to start. Once you get me talking about this, I'll go on, and I want to make sure I don't go on. So I'm going to talk about the Wisconsin Central Sands region today, and just to kind of organize um, and set us up for a solid discussion, I'm going to talk a little bit about the environmental history of the region um, and then the problem and the conflict of irrigated agriculture and surface waters, and then a little bit about my work specifically. So first, let's talk about some history. How did the Central Sands come to be the Central Sands? Um, well, there used to be a glacial lake, Lake Wisconsin, and it had a catastrophic draining event. And this draining event le left the coarse sediments in the area, and these cor coarse sediments became what we think of as the Wisconsin Central Sands. Um, and the Wisconsin Central Sands, they make up uh, several countries in the center of this state, or countries, counties in the center of this state. Um, one great thing about being from Wisconsin is we always have a map. Um, so here's the Central Sands region. Um, Marquette County, Portage County, Washara, Wood, and one more. Adams, thank you. Um, so those are the parts of several, those counties make up the Central Sands region. And really, the central sands are known for their sandy soil. And you know, I, I'm, I was a soil scientist first before I became an environmental biophysicist. Biophys and we're pretty close to, to the county for which our state's soil was named. So does anybody know what our state's soil is? The Antigo Silt Loam, right? So the Antigo Silt Loam became our state's soil. And, 
And when it became out of state soil, some of the reasons for it is that, you know, it, it's very productive for agriculture, um, it supports forestry, all of these wonderful things about it, and it's kind of like the, the hero soil of our state. Um, if there were to be a villainous soil in our state, it would be plain field, sandy loam. Um, and that's kind of how it, has, how it was cast, the soil in the central sands historically. It was the last agricultural land to sell. And um, the poorest residents in our state were the ones who purchased soil in the sand counties. Um, and in the 1930s, the mid-1930s, 1934 and 1935, there was a, was a Dust Bowl here in central Wisconsin. So that was the time of the Wisconsin Dust Bowl. And uh, during this time, just five, approximately five to seven inches of uh, precipitation that were lower than averages. And this led to just a ton of farms getting abandoned, um, people, people going hungry, um, and just a lot of misery in the Central Sands region. And also a lot of erosion. Um, I think they lost about a foot of topsoil um, just during the Dust Bowl. So following that time, we saw you know, uh, the planting of these windbreaks. So if you're, you're driving, sometimes you can see the old windbreak plantings um, of just several you know, trees planted in a row. That's a wind, windbreak. And a lot of different strategies uh, to keep that soil in place. Um, but really, the way in which that we started to see the central sands that it is today and, and the irrigation, that rise of irrigation, it happened after World War II. And it happened because there was an excess of aluminum pipe. And uh, <laughs> using all this aluminum pipe, um, you know, we, we saw just an increase in, in irrigation with high-capacity wells in the central sands. So in 1950, there were about 50 uh, high-capacity wells in the Wisconsin Central Sands. And we define a high-capacity well as any, anything that can pump above 1,000 gallons per minute. Um, and in today, there are approximately over 3,500 high-capacity wells in the Central Sands. So that's really been the trajectory of growth that we've seen. Um, but with that growth came great agricultural success for our state. Uh, so the, the number of farmers after that Dust Bowl consolidated, there was a lot of land consolidation, and there were about 140 potato and vegetable growers um, operating primarily in the Central Sands region. And Wisconsin is a top five state for several different vegetables. Um, so number three in the United States for potatoes. Number one, east of the Mississippi. Um, and it's also a top five state for sweet corn, beans, peas, and these crops are really important to our economy. Um, and they're all grown primarily in the central sands, other than the seed potatoes that are grown in, in the Antigo area. So that's great, right? Um, that, that sounds pretty good. What could, what could the problem be? Um, well, the central sands region has also been you know, home to several abundant surface waters. Um, so over 80 lakes, uh, 650 miles of trout streams and several wetlands in the region. And uh, also there were, you know, prior to the development of um, intensive agriculture, there was very clean drinking water um, from the groundwater system. So we are going to take a little break and just talk about an aquifer and talk about just the, the way that the Central Sands region aquifer operates. So I want you to imagine that this is an aquifer, this glass of beer. Um, an aquifer has boundaries, so this aquifer has boundaries. On the, on the eastern side, it would be the Fox and Wolf rivers for the Central Sands. On the western side, it would be the Wisconsin River. Um, the Central Sands has an unconfined aquifer. So, and in its course, so if you imagine this beer is just uh, full of coarse sediments, um, that's, that's kind of what the central sands are like. Um, and if we think about just the surface waters, so our rivers and our lakes are at the top of the aquifer. So here's kind of, this is going to be, this is going to be my river here. And the river, so when you see a river or a lake on the landscape, that's the water table. So I don't know if you can see this. That's the water table. So if we put a high-capacity well 
um, one high capacity well <laughs> in, in, into this aquifer. All right. That's not, that's not so bad. You know, it doesn't really impact the river. But we've been talking a lot about <laughs> cumulative impacts, right? Ha has anyone heard that term? It's been, it's been in the news a lot. We've been having a lot of policy debates about the cumulative impacts of wells. When you put one well in, should you consider the other wells? So <laughs> I should have practiced that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a diversion. <laughs> All right, so there's some foam. Ignore the foam, um, but you can see it's the river that's really going to be impacted in this area. And if we were to keep pumping, <laughs> that river is going to go dry. Um, and this is what's happening out west, right? So out west, in California and regions like this, they, they're pumping a lot of ground, groundwater, and they're, not <laughs> and they're not replacing it. But here, guess what? We've got rain, right? So we, every year, we have a fair amount of recharge. It comes back in, so we don't see the same types of impacts that they see out west. Um, and we're not worried in our state that we're going to run out of water. But we really want to manage for this top of the aquifer. This is where our surface waters are. <laughs> so, so that's really the problem. And that, that's kind of what's happening in terms of the, the hydrology and the hydrogeology. Um, and really what I want. Every, other than that I cannot drink beer through seven straws at the same time. The other thing that I'd like everyone to take away from this is that the groundwater and the surface waters in our state are connected. Um, so what, when, when you impact one, you impact the other. Um, the second thing is that uh, their cumulative impacts are real. You can't um, add one well without really considering how all of the other wells are operating in terms of the groundwater. So, you know, that said, I want to talk a little bit about my own work. Um, and what I do is I study the water. So what is an environmental biophysicist? I study cycles. So I study the water cycle. I study the energy cycle. I study the nitrogen cycle. And uh, I love plants, and, and I love crops. Um, you know, as you mentioned, I, I got interested in growing food a long time ago. So I really like to work with farmers and to think about how plants kind of act as referees in all of these cycles and, and how humans and plants are interacting and changing the water cycle and changing the energy cycle and changing the nitrogen cycle. Um, I, I didn't draw them, but there, you know, there are plants <laughs> all around the top of this aquifer. And I actually, I study this top part primarily um, because one of the processes that's really important for us in Wisconsin and in Minnesota as well, in managing water in these sandy systems is understanding the recharge, right? So like how, how much recharge comes back every year. Um, and the process that I study is actually called evapotranspiration. And this is just a, a fancy word for crop water use. So how much water the crops use kind of determines in the central sands how much water is recharged back into the aquifer. So when you water your house plant, um, where, where do we think that the water's going? Like, I, I think the common way to think about, like, what is, what is the plant doing with this water is that the water's going into the actual plant. That's not true. 90% of the water that goes into a house plant when you're watering it goes into this process of evapotranspiration. Um, and, and basically, like a, if you think of, you know, my hand is a leaf, the leaves have little mouths on them, and the mouths are called stomata. And the price of doing business, the price of photosynthesis for a, a plant is, is giving up water. Through, so anytime these stomata are open, carbon dioxide can move into the plant but water is lost out. And that's really why we water plants. That's why we irrigate crops. 
Um, and that's really what I study. And what I did for my PhD is I partnered um, with a, with a sixth-generation family farm in the Central Sands, Isherwood Farms. Does anyone know Justin Isherwood? People know, people know Isherwood. <laughs> All right. So he let me just dig up and just make a mess on his farm with my instruments. And we, we buried all of these instruments in order to measure groundwater recharge. And I, and I took measurements of photosynthesis. We took measurements of um, the stomata and the crop um, development. And we, we measured evapotranspiration in several different ways. And after I finished up my degree, you know, I, I took a step back and I wanted to think about the bigger picture. Um, because I, I had done some work and thought, all right, well, we, we have some estimates for these different numbers and how much water the crops are using. I wanted to think about how we can try to manage water at different scales. So what I'm doing now, the project that I'm working on, is you know, trying to come up with strategies of like how can one farmer save water. Like, say one farmer wants to implement conservation strategies on their farm. Um, how could, how could they save water? Or, or how can a community manage water? So, you know, with the Wisconsin, partnering with the Wisconsin Potato and Vegetable Growers Association, they're very interested in just promoting water conservation. Like, what, what should we be promoting and thinking about as a community? What specifically, you know, which types of strategies? Precision agriculture is an example. Um, certain crop rotations. Um, and then finally, the, the last part of my research is thinking at just this bigger state level of how when we convert you know, forests into irrigated agriculture, how is it going to impact the, wa the water cycle? How is that going to impact our drinking water? Um, and also, how is irrigated agriculture going to impact regional climate? And that sounds kind of wild, but getting back to that evapotranspiration idea of leaves losing water through these stomata, Think about fields losing water. Um, and when you lose water, um, there's, a pro there's actually evaporative cooling that occurs. So you can, say, you can see these large-scale changes um, to regional climate from changing the land cover on that climate and the land use on that climate. So that's, that's what I'm working on right now. So I will repeat the question. The question was, um, he's heard that an acre of corn transpires 4,000 gallons of water a day on a hot summer day. Does, is that equivalent to an, an acre of trees? And th we, were, we were actually t talking about this yeah. earlier. This is a really good question, and we, we want to get to the bottom of this <laughs> issue um, because Trees, trees do use quite a bit of water, and oftentimes trees can have roots that can access groundwater. Um, and in the Central Sands region, we have not directly measured water use from trees and compared that to water use from different irrigated crops at that acre scale, right? So the measurements that I did, they were at like this scale, and we need to have measurements at several different scales until this past year. So um, a collaborator and colleague of mine, Dr. Ankur Desai, has installed these flux towers with support from the Wisconsin Potato and Vegetable Growers Association and the Department of Natural Resources to really get at that question. A and I would say that the hypothesis is, and what we understand from research that has been done outside of the Central Sands and just our understanding of these different vegetation types is it's going to be very close, close enough that it was worth spending the money to do the experiment to understand the differences. So I can't answer your question exactly, but um, hopefully the scientific community, I think, will be able to provide some answers. I live in near Plainfield, Wisconsin, and I farm near Plainfield, Wisconsin. I've got three high capacity wells and some of those wells are used to farm multiple fields. Um, I've lived there my whole life. I honestly never heard of the Wisconsin Dust Bowl before, but I'm not saying you're wrong. <laughs> but I, what I know is I live right on a lake that's 
three miles from Long Lake, which has become the poster child of lakes in Central Sands. And I've lived on this lake since 1983, and we've owned the property since 1971. In 2012, that lake was as low as I've ever seen it, and it was probably as low as it's ever been since white man came here, maybe since the glacier. That's when this issue became a hot button topic. And 2012 was the end of a 30 year drought cycle that since then, my lake right now has higher lake levels than I've seen in my lifetime. And I believe the only time previous it was higher was in the 1950s, the early 1950s. And uh, in the future, we're going to be getting a lot more, according to scientists, we're getting a lot more moisture right now. And that's being pumped up from the uh, highest uh, ocean temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico. And what I've read is they expect this to be a continuing thing into the future. Um, but my lake... It's gone up and down eight feet numerous times since 1900. And uh, farmers, the lake I'm on, farmers used to cut hay off the bottom of it. And, uh, you know, it just changes. It's cyclic. And it's all, uh, Mother Nature, it takes water away from us and then it gives it back to us. Uh, we have problems. Um, I'm concerned about nitrates in the groundwater, and I'm concerned about uh, water levels going up and down. But we got to kind of rely on science to find issues to things to help us. The farmers that were I've been, I've uh, upgraded all my irrigation to use less water. A lot of them have. We're, we're we don't put on as any more chemicals than we feel we have to because it's expensive. And right now, there's scientists, uh, forgot where, but they found a way to take a bacteria, uh, I'm not saying, it's some kind of a bacteria or a fungi. No, it's not a fungi either. It's something. <laughs> it starts with a C. Hey, sir, how about we, you've introduced lots of topics. Let's let her get back, talk about the cyclic nature of Can I have 10 uh, seconds? Levels? Can I have 10 seconds? One question. Okay. Just answer, ask a question. Okay. That would be great. But no. you've brought up some great points. Okay. I'll, I'll you just need a real question. I'll leave it to somebody else. But they okay. are working on trying to make plants make their own nitrogen from the air. And there are things that do that and are trying to introduce it to our crops. Thank you. Okay. Lots of questions. Lots yeah. of topics there. I'll let sure. you tackle it as best you can. Okay. First of all, thank you. Did you drive up from Plainfield? No, I live up here. Oh, okay. Well, I, mean, I live both places. Well, thank you very much for those comments. And um, I, what was your name? John. John. All right. John illustrates something really critical. This is an important social issue, and th this is a problem that really impacts so many different people in our state. Um, and it, that farmers generally want to do right by us, right? So he's put in efficient irrigation systems. He's looking for efficient solutions. Um, and I want to address that cyclical issue. Um, this cyclical issue is what makes our challenge so much trickier than the water challenges out west. I'm not going to do this beer thing again. <laughs> but you know, if you remember, when I, the out west version of this, I just drink this down, and nothing puts any water back. Um, but, but what we know here is when there is a drought, um, our, our use of water, all uses of water are exacerbated. Um, and when there are floods, like, did we get over 1,800 millimeters of precipitation? I'm sorry, millimeters, scientific. We got so much rain this year mm -hmm. in 2018. It caused a lot of trouble. Um, so we know that with a changing climate, we have to be able to help um, ma you know, agriculture manage floods and manage droughts. Um, and 
this is, this is just a critical issue. And you're very right in terms of the cycles. Like, it, there are cycles, and we, we see these cycles, but we have to be able to try to understand and manage for those cycles. And I think um, when this problem first kind of came up and the scientific community was first understanding it, we weren't thinking as cyclically because we were taking our cues for a lot of the from a lot of the irrigation research that has been done out west. Um, but really, we have to think very differently because we're getting water and we're getting really unpredictable water. Um, so thank you very much for that comment. Um, on the end fixation issue, yes. Um, to, there was a, it was a collaboration between the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the University of California, Davis. And they figured out how to have field corn fix nitrogen in the same way that legumes do, um, like soybeans. Or, or peas. So that was a, that's a huge discovery that kind of changed the game um, in terms of can we now have crops that are uh, working with microbes and, and fixing nitrogen from, that's present in the air. So, so yes, that, I'm really hopeful about that discovery too. Mm. Uh, you explained very well how the hydrology works. Rain comes down, it comes out of uh, a thousand gallons a minute, uh, 350 times in, in this area. Um, but so, does it equalize itself? Um, you know, what's the end message? Are we taking more than is replacing? And uh, you did mention the Western problems. I believe is it the Agala or Agila aquifer out Ogallala. there? Ogallala. Ogallala. Anyway, um, how dire are we out there, or is that in your field of expertise? I, I've heard that we are going to run out out there. So how does Wisconsin compare to the West? OK, yes. Thank you for that question. So how does Wisconsin compare to the West? The West is managing, they are managing their aquifers for depletion. They are managing to, to, to try to very carefully meter out, and, and, and with that, um, impending kind of we're going to run out of water in our aquifers mentality. Um, that, that's, that's that depletion management is how we think of that. Um, we, we, do, we need to manage our water, but we don't need to manage it for depletion. We need to manage our groundwater um, thinking about ecosystem services, thinking about balancing all of our uses of it. So if we think of surface waters and streams and wetlands, like those are uses and they're, they're valuable to our state. We're managing for, for us to have healthy lakes and streams, and we're also managing to have a viable and, um, you know, a viable agricultural industry in our state. So that we're managing for that balance, not for depletion, not for the we're going to run out of water scenario. I answer your question? Okay. Uh, you mentioned trout streams. Uh, how are they faring, and how are the, the stream ecosystems doing with these fluctuations of up and down? I would think erosion would be a major concern, and, and just the ecosystem stresses. So that's a great question. I can speak to. The Little Plover River has kind of been the canary in the coal mine in terms of stream ecosystem health and, and how it's been faring. So one of the, the issues that, or one of the reasons that this, these issues became so contentious is uh, for the first time between 2005 and 2009, um, so prior to that 2012 drought, that was when the Little Plover River went dry. Um, and there are several, several fish kills in the region. And it was, it was one of those things where not only did that, that trout stream go dry, but there was like a cautionary research tale in that there was, there was a very comprehensive study done um, in the 1960s looking at the Little Plover River and predicting that if um, irrigated development was to continue, that the, that the stream would go dry. So when the stream actually went dry, it's kind of a, bi a big moment. Um, but there, there have been stresses in other streams as well. I am not a stream ecologist or um, a, a, a trout expert, so I can't speak to really the specifics of what's happened. I can speak to just how more on a social level that really has fueled the conflict 
um, that specific river and, and just it really mobilized a lot of conservation communities. Yeah, doctor. Um, I used to live in Sheboygan and <clears throat> I spent a lot of time on the big pond and I was amazed at hearing stories about how many trillions of gallons a day are evaporated out of Lake Michigan. And there was times when I could walk from Sheboygan to Manitowoc, which is 20 miles, and not get your feet wet. There was beach all along that way. <clears throat> At the same time, places up here were having problems with low water levels. Okay, But to see something like Lake Michigan go from a shoreline to 20 or 30 feet of uh, beach is amazing with that amount of water. Now, when we talk about, uh, John's talked about his irrigation system, is, is he's get, trying to get it less than 1,000 gallons a minute. Has anybody ever done any studies about what crops are the most profitable to use in the central, or grow in the central sands area if we're gonna use 500 gallons a minute or whatever? Because if you're using 1,000 gallons a minute and you're growing a lot of corn, Corn is not a, a crop that's very expensive, okay, compared to um, other, other crops. Wouldn't it be better just to grow the crops that you could make the most profit on because you're using 1,000 gallons a minute? Is there ever been studies done like that? So I am doing that study right now. <laughs> not, <laughs> not totally, not everything you brought up. I want to be very careful about the word you used, profitability, um, because I, that is a part that, of the equation that I am not looking into. I'm looking into yields and the part where you discussed looking at different types of crop rotations and how much water they all use. So, um, you know, where, whereas the work that I did during my PhD it was a lot of like field studies, now I have and the scientific community m more than myself. We has provided me with, and in addition to my own measurements, have, have enough to start using computer, big computer simulations and these, um, we, we call them agroecosystem models, to try to do some of like the crazy calculations that you're um, kind of hinting at. Whereas, you know, we know that there's corn, there's potatoes, and even in potatoes, there's your russet burr banks, there are these gold, and those are all long season potato. There are these mid season um, gold rush type potatoes. Uh, there's peas, there's beans, and all of these different crops, they use different amounts of water. Um, they're planted and harvested at different times, and they have different stressors, right? So the, the study that I'm currently working on is looking at all right, am I, I, I can't do this out in the field, right? Like, I can't measure and monitor and crazily tear up Isherwood's farm for. 50 years to answer this question, but I can do it in a computer. And I can look at wet years and dry years and, and try to simulate, like, all right, if I planted corn during wet years versus dry years, how much would that, that rotation use versus a mid-season potato versus a, a late-season potato? So uh, that, that's the work. That's my project right now. So that's what I'm trying to understand. And I can project yields but it really takes some partnership and some strong um, agricultural econ economic, ugh, economics to understand the, the relationship between yields and profits. Um, so hopefully, I, I, I think that once we have a better handle on the different yields and the relationship between yield and water and our weather years in these crop rotations, that we'll be able to, to project out and understand the, the profit part of it. Drinking beer in a, through a straw is not a good idea. <laughs> no. um, is, is it possible to drill uh, a variety of wells, like three, 500 feet, and measure the water table, and then uh, over a period of time to see fluctuations in the table itself? Yes, and I mean, these, these records actually exist. And um, some of my collaborators at the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey and the USGS have very strong monitoring records and are, and are using them from these types of monitoring wells. Um, and like I mentioned, even though this part of the aquifer drives the questions that I ask, I actually don't work very much in this. I work with the crops. 
Um, but you're absolutely right. These long-term records exist and are being used. Uh, yeah, question online. Um, a long time ago, Perrier was interested in putting in some wells. Are there any of those sort of gourmet water companies around, and were they ever successful? So this is outside of my wheelhouse. Okay, um, sorry. So I am. Oh, <laughs> John. John knows. Yeah. A trout stream just south of uh, Plainfield near Coloma, and uh, it was stopped by the public. And that would have been a bad place to put it. It's right by the headwaters of the McCann or the White River. I think it was the McCann. Okay, thanks. Question right here. I, I have a whole bunch of questions. I'm going to try to limit them. Uh, all right, it sounds like Mother Nature kind of saves us from whatever things we're doing to the earth by raining every so often, it refills our aquifers. My question is, if we had a standard, a, a certain amount of rainfall every year, whatever that millimeter is in your brain, and we, we use the water as we use now, would, would the water level in the aquifers go down? In other words, if we had a constant source of water, would we be losing water by the way we farm? And then second of all, we drive through the, the sandy plains on a regular basis, every few weeks. And it always amazes me that you'll see plants being watered at high noon on a 90 degree day in the sun. And we all have gardens and you know that the last time we, we would do that would water then. So my question is, what are you doing from a scientific perspective to either prove that good or bad? All right, so I, I think there are actually three, question, three questions here. I need more. <laughs> Maybe more. <laughs> um, so first I want to address this issue of Mother Nature saving us with, with the recharge. So I don't think she is, um, because I, I, and I, I didn't talk too much about this, but yes, she, she gives us more water, um, but she's not cleaning this up, mm -hmm. right? So that's one area where, you know, from, from a perspective of, um, nitrates going into the water, we, we're fertilizing our groundwater. Um, and and what we, that is one thing where we won't be saved from that unless we start to think creatively about solutions um, to clean up our groundwater. So your question I, I thought was really interesting about the will, will things stay the same um, if, if nothing else changes? And I actually um, did a study and it, it was published last year, kind of looking at that with my field data of the will, will this stay the same? And it, in, uh, in physical terms, we say, like, are, do we have a system at steady state? Um, and the answer is yes, actually. So, it, and that kind of gets back to what was mentioned earlier about are we managing for depletion? No, we're not managing for depletion. We're not going to keep losing water. Things are going to generally stay the same, but there's going to be fluctuation. Oh, I'd have to fill back to my river. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there's going to be fluctu the fluctuation. Like, where is that steady state fluctuation happening? Well, it's happening in this area that we really care about. Like, we, we don't want this little bit of fluctuation. We're not going to go way down here, but we're going to see this little bit of fluctuation here. Um, so I guess stay the same is kind of a relative term, right? Um, so I, did, did that, wait, there was one more. Oh, last question. The issue of irrigating at high noon. So we, we know that if, because of evaporative losses, if you are running a sprinkler um, at high noon, that there are going to be losses, and we call them, um, there's wind loss and there's evaporative losses that happen from the sprinkler systems. Um, but like John mentioned, there are new sprinkler systems. So this is an engineering issue. There's some, there's some new systems that are supposed to reduce wind losses and evaporative losses. So it's, it's a known issue. Um, but it's also an, it, it's, it's, it's trickier than just turning it off during that time because most of the growers that I know and work with, want, they have one well that services multiple fields. So in order to service all of the fields, the sprinkler's got to run during the day 
um, on, the field, on some of the fields, but it'll run during the night on others. And we know that it's just better from this um, wind loss and, and evaporative loss perspective to be irrigating at night. I, I, have, a, I have a question regarding uh, uh, quality of water. And, and you almost answered it just, <laughs> just before. But uh, you've been talking a lot about the quantity of water, but the quality, uh, uh, could you do work with that? Can you uh, speak to that? As to you, nitrates have been mentioned, but there's others. Right. So in the experiment that I talked about with the simulations, I'm looking at water quality in that experiment as well, in terms of how much nitrogen is, is, you know, is there in terms of crop uptake, and then how much is leached into the groundwater system, and, and how, how you, lose, you lose more nitrogen oftentimes during wet years, right? Because th if you think about the sandy soil, if you have a large rain event come in, you're going to lose your fertilizer. And, and it's not something that any farmer wants, right? Because if you lose fertilizer, you, you're losing money. Um, and so I, I'm looking at it in that context, but there are several scientists doing field studies at, at the University of Wisconsin looking at um, that, that trying to understand at the field scale how much nitrogen is lost to the groundwater. And um, scientists are also doing studies on, now that there's, in, in some areas, there's so much nitrate in the groundwater that maybe we should start thinking of that as a fertilizer credit. Um, and some states are doing this. Some states say, all right, if we can understand what the background value of nitrogen that there is in the irrigation water, we can factor that in to the fertilizer recommendations. And those studies are currently happening as well at UW-Madison. The, the gentleman was speaking about crops to use less water, and you referred an answer to him. The farmers use multiple crops because you can't raise the same crop every year. So like, you, like I raise potatoes, green beans, peas, sweet corn, and it's, it's rotated. And some of them are high water use and some are low water use. And it, it's what dictates it is the plant health because you would have, if you tried to raise the crop, same crop multiple years, they won't even let us now. But if you tried to raise them multiple years, you end up with more disease, which requires more spraying. So it's not trying to find a crop that you can grow because you can't grow that same crop all the time. And uh, I'll just let it go to somebody else. Oh, sure. I'll, I'll make a quick comment on that. That just adds kind of like a fun, like, logic puzzle to what you, you were talking about earlier in that, all right, so we're thinking about these rotations. We know potatoes can only be grown every three years. That's just the disease and pest management protocol. Peas, every seven years, does that sound fair? Six to seven, Six to seven years. So like, we have to also be factoring those kind of logical rules in when we're thinking ahead of what could be done to save water. So, so when we travel through the Plains area, which that's my husband, which we do every few weeks, um, we used to live in Madison too, um, he's right. We see in noon all the, you know, the things going on. We see it during when pouring rain it's on. Um, are there methods, other methods than this, this circling water in the air type of watering system? Are they looking at drip systems or through the ground system to try to um, give water, let's say, to the plants? And also, um, I know that agriculture is a big business. I mean, you can't get away from that. Um, you ha we, there's a lot of people to feed, but is, there, is it better to grow like one crop per year or if you had on that same land various other crops growing that would kind of complement each other, is that possible? So there's like two questions here. Okay. Um, so the first question about the um, different types of irrigation. Yeah, there's several types of you know, ways to deliver water. There's the, we call the irrigation systems that we have pre predominantly here in Wisconsin as a center pivot irrigation. 
um, and sprinkler systems. So there's new technology looking at like the nozzle pressure and ways to, to change the nozzle, nozzle pressure. I talked a little bit about precision agriculture. There's precision irrigation where you can look at your field and look at the soil properties and how they vary within a field. So like I, I talked about the sands in a very simple way. Um, but the truth is, if you go and you stand out on a field, it's not so simple. It's not all exactly the same. There may be some parts of the field that can hold more water than other parts of the field. So for our center pivot systems, there's they, they call them variable rate systems. And using the different nozzle pressures, you can deliver more water to the coarser parts of your field and less water to parts to the parts of your field that are finer, finer textured, have more, maybe a little more silt, maybe a little more organic matter, and they can hold more water. So that's kind of one way that works within the framework um, of how irrigation's already done here in the central sands. Um, but there are other types of irrigation that are used out west, like flood irrigation um, or drip irrigation, because out, out west, their evaporative losses are much higher than ours because it's so much more arid. Um, and what's kind of interesting out west is the flood irrigation was kind of seen as a villain, um, and drip was seen as better, but that it turns out, like, you can't, even if like under a scientist's perfect study where everything is measured, if one system seems more efficient than the other system, so like if drip seems so much more efficient than flood, what, they, what they're finding out west that is that in practice, sometimes those differences in efficiency, they just kind of get washed out, no pun intended, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, they, so, so that's kind of the trickier part when you're evaluating irrigation efficiency is like there's the efficiency that the engineers intend and then there's the efficiency in practice and sometimes those things don't always match up. So, um, so I think the variable rate idea where you grid the field up and you change the nozzle pressure um, and potentially apply different amounts of water to different areas within the field that have um, differences in soil properties, that's really what I'm starting to see the growing community in Wisconsin embrace a little bit more. Um, they, they, there's a lot of growers that I know who are dabbling with that, who are experimenting with those types of systems. I'm doing some research um, to try to support them, and I know others who are doing research to support them, um, to try to understand, like, are these, all right, say you grid up a field, and it's, it, there's more clay, there's more silt, there's more organic matter in one area, and there's a coarser spot, let's, let's irrigate them differently, how much water would we save? So those are the kinds of questions we need to be asking um, to understand whether that nozzle technology and that variable rate technology is going to save water. So, So it, it's tricky because it gets back to this like logic puzzle issue in that I would say all of these systems are rotational. So there, there aren't any fields where it's the same crop being planted every year because we know that potatoes can only go in every three years. Peas can only go in every six or seven years. So um, one of the things we're trying to understand are, are there better rotations? You know, is potato, sweet corn, field corn, better than potato, snap bean, um, peas, or something like that. Like it, so we, have, we can't look at one year after one year. We have to look at the whole kind of rotations. <laughs> so it's a, it's a great question, and we want to answer it, but it's tricky because <laughs> we have to think yeah, about the sequence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
folks, kind of remember we, we're taping this and we can't hear the questions when you don't have the microphone. Okay, so we'll come back to you if you want to ask another question. I have the microphone. You've got yeah. the microphone. <laughs> so so uh, to me, I, I feel like we're missing the solution. And uh, I think back to my property and my garden. When I first moved in there and built, it was pure sand, beach sand. Same scenario. So what do I do with my pure sand? I, I improve my soil health. And to me, it's not how we irrigate it. Well, why are we irrigating? A lot of other farms don't. We need to improve the soil health. That's the, that's the filter. That's the moisture holder. It, to me, it all boils down to building that soil. And is, is that, I mean, you're working on that, it sounds like, and to build on it. To me, it's the soil. So I, I, I love that question and comment. Um, and, and soil health is kind of like this new and very exciting research frontier that is being championed um, by, by the USDA, um, by the NRCS. And we're seeing a lot of new research in soil health. And you know, soil health is this idea that we should have like a holistic view of the soil, kind of like we have a, a holistic view of the human body. So you know, there's all of this interesting human health research about our guts and the microbiomes in our guts. And this soil health idea says, let's take, those, let's take some of those ideas and think about them in terms of the soil. And can we improve water holding capacity? And you're right, like I, I do think that there are ways to improve the water holding capacity of, of a soil if you build more organic matter into it. Um, and that's definitely an area of work. I'm not doing a lot with that, but other scientists in this, very, in this area are. Um, and it's very important. I will say it's particularly hard in the sands um, just because the organic matter, it, as you know from your garden, it was really low to start with. So it takes a long time to try to build it up. Um, but you're right, that's, that's definitely a solution. Um, and even during the time that I worked uh, in the field work that I've done, like a lot of farmers are putting organic amendments um, to slowly try to build up that water holding capacity. But to put it into context, um, getting back to plain filled versus anigo, if you have a foot of plain filled soil, a pro it, there's approximately one inch of water storage. So, and, and if you have a foot of anigo silt loam, that champion soil, it's, it's about four to five inches of water storage. So, it's going to be a long, a long road, but I think one that deserves an effort. Is on? Okay. I, what I'm trying to get a handle on is your sense of, of uh, danger or of thresholds. So we look at climate change, and sure, there's been huge variations in climate through the millennia, but what we're looking at now is an exponential rate of CO2 in the atmosphere not recorded in millennia going through ice cores. And so, and John, I appreciate you coming and talking about Central Sands. I was a student at Point when the little plover was going dry, and those brook trout were there 12,000 years ago when the Wisconsin glaciation ended. But if the stream goes totally dry, those brook trout don't necessarily replenish unless there's a feeder stream with a holdover population. They would be gone for all of time. So that's that threshold question that I'm interested in. You said that the wa nature replenishes it, and as water in the Central Sands is replaced, but is it the same variability that we've seen forever? Or is through millennia, we did not have this many high capacity wells. Are we changing 12,000 years of history now with an exponential rate of change? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's a good question. <laughs> no, that's a, great, that's a great question. And I mean, yeah, I was gonna say, I was like, I'm gonna have to go through this. So I, how do you say, how do you, how could we not, not be changing, right? 3,500 high capacity wells. Yes, to, an to answer your question, we're changing it. And the change is interesting, right? There, there are these two ways of looking at the impacts. There's this long-term way of looking at it where you think about the recharge coming in every single year. Um, and, and that's gonna be fluctuation that's driven a lot by our precipitation. But all these wells, they're pumping at the same time, so I can't, like, I can't do it, <laughs> but they're all pumping at the same time every year. It's when the crops grow, right? So 
July and August are, are when most of the water gets pumped out, and then there's like the slow recovery. Um, so the, the, the stresses, are there's a little bit of a delay, and the surface water stresses, you see them in August, September. And that stress, like that annual stress from just the wells pumping happens every single year. And if you are a fish in a trout stream, it doesn't matter if, if the water is going to come back. If it's <laughs> gone, you're dead, right? So yes, that threshold has happened. And there's a lot of conversations happening now about what is a public rights flow? How low do we have to maintain, or how high do we have to maintain the streams in order to avoid that type of ca catastrophe from happening? Um, so that's my best attempt <laughs> to answer your question. And from the quality standpoint too, sorry to keep going after saying that, but I, at the quality standpoint, we've, we've, we know what that threshold is. It's 10 parts per million of nitrate. And we know that that, that that number we've established has adverse impacts on human health, um, especially for, for babies. It, it values at 10 ppm of nitrate or higher can cause what's called blue baby syndrome and impact the hemoglobin in babies. So that threshold is there. And there are several um, wells and several areas in the Central Sands region and throughout our state where we have exceeded that water quality threshold. Uh, so my question um, concerns the regulatory process of siting new high-capacity wells. Okay. It's my understanding this is kind of driving the controversy in the area. Um, and the DNR is kind of tied in knots as to what regulatory approach is best. One perspective is that you should model cumulative effects of wells within a geographical area, whereas others advocate regulating on the basis of the individual well. Do you know, uh, two questions. One is, how much pressure is there for establishing new high capacity wells, and where is the pressure the greatest in the central sands? And number two, um, which regulatory approach do you think will carry the day? Oh, gosh. <laughs> gosh. Oof. <laughs> Um, so, to your question about, the, f the first question was about cum cumulative impacts, right? And just whether that, sh that should be evaluated from a scientific perspective or the single well. I'm going to put this to you. I, we've, we've talked about this a little bit tonight. What do you guys think? Cumulative impacts or yeah. one well, right? So, here's... These, these wells are already all in here. When, if I'm going to decide, do I want to put this new well in, should I act like these wells don't exist? Or should I take it into account, right? So from a scientific perspective, there is tremendous scientific evidence to support evaluating cumulative impacts. Um, in terms of... The second question was much trickier, right? And that was what I think should happen for, with water regulation in our state. <laughs> I'm going to skirt that a little bit uh, and, and answer it in terms of my strategies, just as a researcher. And, and there's a tremendous amount of debate. And this is, this is important, too, actually. Um, the time of like scientists acting like we're unbiased and we're, we're somehow like sage-like, and we have no horse in these races, that, that time is over, right? They're, my social science colleagues have done a ton of research, and we know that scientists are biased. Um, I'm biased. We have, we, we have opinions, we have politics, and we can't ignore those politics. Um, in, in, in terms of this water debate, there's a lot of discussion of how how the solutions should look. Should they be top-down solutions where this is how much water everybody gets, top-down, figure it out? Or should there be bottom-up solutions? And th those are more like the community comes together, say, you know, farmers come together and we partner and try to generate ways to conserve water. Um, in the time that I started studying this issue, so I started really getting interested in studying this issue in like 2011, this 
the regulation has changed, has gone back and forth between thinking about cumulative impacts or not thinking about cumulative impacts. So I have tried to think um, and think about my research and do research that will provide information for a political you know, system where we are supporting bottom-up solutions and there is no regulation, because I've seen that, or a political system that is top-down and there is more regulation. I think in Wisconsin it's such an interesting time because both of those political systems could exist and have existed in the past 10 years. As scientists, it's important to be able to provide information for both. <laughs> so that's my skirting answer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's a good question. I think that there, uh, there, there's a discussion about replacement wells. So, like, should, should growers be able to replace wells when, when, when they you know, need repair and stuff like that? Um, and in terms of, like, areas where there's expansion, there's some expansion happening um, in, in, like, the, I think it's in primarily in Wood County, looking at um, pine plantation conversion. And that's why we have a lot of interest in how much water the, the pine plantations or, or pine forests are using compared um, to irrigated agriculture. So there's areas like that. There's areas and people are very kind of concerned about what would it look like if expansion happened in like the northeast part of the sands towards like the Tomorrow River because people love and ha you know, really love those areas. So there, there's some concern about like what would it look like if expansion happened in that direction. Um, those are kind of the two areas where I've heard discussion. Um, just looking at the historic vegetation in the central sands, I mean, huge wetlands. The Great Swamp of central Wisconsin, massive tamarack swamps, poor fens. I mean, a lot of those places are growing crops now. They're ditched and drained. Yeah. So what was a recharge area, the wetlands, are now, you know, being pumped for, to produce crops now. Um, so if you could just speak to that, just the loss of all these huge, vast wetlands in the central sands and how that's affected the water budget. And then just a comment I have is, you know, potato's not hard to grow. I mean, I, I haven't bought a potato in 15 years. Anybody with tillable ground can grow a potato and do it sustainably using organic methods. And we all depend on industrial agriculture, but we're all capable of growing our own gardens and producing a lot of this stuff right out of our back door and mitigating these impacts of just depending completely on industrial agriculture. So that's a comment. Okay, so um, in regards to the drainage ditches, yes, you're absolutely right. So there was a lot of marshlands in the Central Sands area and um, there, if you look on um, just you know, Google, Google or Google Earth, you'll see these really straight lines um, and and they, they look like streams, but they're just too straight. Those are your drainage ditches. Um, and, and that's actually another area that's being debated is like, well, what should these ditches look like? Because guess what? Some of them are, are trout habitat. Um, you know, some of them are actually, you, you can go and you can see trout spawning around this time of year. Um, and should we continue to be draining them when the soils are already drained. Like that's, that's definitely a debate that's underway um, in the central sands. And to your, to your comment about potatoes are not hard to grow, I'm gonna push back hard on that. Um, <laughs> just because, you know what, it, it's one of those things, and this is why it's really, really valuable for scientists to partner with farmers and to not just do experiments in a bubble is it's easy to grow and, it, and it's wonderful to grow when you're not incurring a risk and it's not your livelihood, right? So I, I, I'm a gardener and guess what? You know, I grow all sorts of great things in my garden, but if I have a bad year, if I fail, if they get a disease, if something happens, I, I, I'm not, you know, screwed in terms of my livelihood. I can still go to the grocery store. So I think just the, like, the gardener's model is just so different from the, the, the businessman and li livelihood model. Um, so I don't think you can really compare those two things. One quick question. Uh, of the 3,500 wells, do, do they go, how many go dry every year? Or do wells not go dry in the Sands area? Sure. Um, we, I, I have not heard 
of that as an issue. So like, once again, here in the Midwest, we don't have this issue of like a well going dry and a neighbor getting upset that the well went, that their, that their <laughs> well went dry and, and being upset at all the wells around them. Um, that, that's definitely an issue they see more in like the Ogallala, um, in, the, in the Western states where there, there are these litigious issues with wells going dry and who's to blame. Um, we haven't been seeing that here. Uh, and that gets back to, to the recharge and, and, and the wells being deep enough and us not losing enough water to really be seeing those wells going dry. The, the trout streams in, uh, across the Buena Vista Marsh, uh, they don't go dry. They've got wonderful rainbow, or not rainbow, uh, brook trout in them. Um, another thing I wanted to say is about your analogy about all the straws in a, uh -oh. in a glass of water. <laughs> A lot of people think that it isn't how many straws you got, it's where they're placed. If you place a straw or numerous straws right at the headlands of the Plover River, that's going to affect it more than the, ones, than the other ones that are a distance away. The, it's, that's more surface water than, than your uh, underground water. And it bubbles up in an area to make that tr river and then if you use it up right at the where, the where it's coming from, that's the problem. One of the things that they looked at doing is taking all the water from the cities of Plover and Steve or Stevens Point, and after they treat it, to pump it up farther north on the Plover River so it'll augment it, especially in the dry times. Uh, another farmer, Wysocki, there's a big controversy over him having a dairy in Saratoga, I think it is. And uh, he offered for anybody that has nitrates in their well to pay for reverse osmosis for the drinking water. That's a start. Uh, so I, that's a great point about where the wells are placed. You're absolutely right. Like, it is a there's a huge difference if a well is really close to a trout stream versus if it's far <coughs> away. Um, and that is definitely something that's being taken into account um, when they look at what, in addition to cumulative impacts, when they look at whether a new well should be placed in an area. So there's this issue of, all right, how many wells are around it? And also, where is it going? Is it within, I think it's 1,200 feet. Is it within 1,200 feet of a trout stream or a valuable water? Um, just because there is this spatial effect immediately surrounding the well. The well pulls what we call a cone of depression. And depending on how close a well is to a stream, it can actually just draw water right out of the stream if it's close enough. I just wondered how fragile aquifers are. I know a few years ago I read some things about fracking and the pressure. I know that's a different system, but how they can um, impact aquifers and damage them and how hard it is to uh, undo that damage. And I just wondered if you could speak to that with all of this fluctuation, some of it natural, cyclical, but now with the impact of all the high capacity wells, is that hard on the aquifers to go up and down the actual architecture of them once, is it possible to destroy them uh, and have them not come back? Yeah, um, so that, that's a great question. And I think it really depends on the specifics of an aquifer and just how, how, how it's structured. Like, is it, is it unconfined like our aquifer in the sands? Are there confining layers? I know with fracking, there's usually some confining layers that they're working with. Um, to your question about just can, can, they be, can they be, you know, irreparably harmed or destroyed, um, I think it's easier from a water quantity standpoint to put water back into an, to an aquifer like the one in the central sands. It's really hard to clean up the water once it's been um, contaminated. So I think if you think of it in those two areas, like, you know, from quantity, you can put it back uh, if, it's, if it's this unconfined type of aquifer like the sands. But it's really hard to clean it up because how, how do you go about cleaning it up um, once, it's, once it's dirty? All of my friends have been uh, putting you on the spot with all these critical questions. 
I just have a curiosity one from back in early part of your presentation. You mentioned uh, uh, the uh, converting of forest land to uh, 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 cropland. And of course up here, we don't see that. And I'm just curious, statewide, uh, is that a, a big factor? Is there a percentage or whatever? Gosh, I don't have a percentage off the top of my head um, to tell you that it's a large, that how, how big of a factor it is. And, and the thing about it is a lot of the conversion has happened already. Um, so a lot of our cropland, our, our, a lot of our forests have been converted to cropland. So um, what we're seeing the conversion of now is like a lot of the, the paper producing pine plantations have, are being converted to cropland because they're, they're no longer profitable. Sorry, I can't give you an exact number. Um, you talked about this a little bit, but surface waters are, you know, there's public rights, public trust doctrine, public has access to those. And then you got a private use of groundwater that's affecting those surface water resources. Can you just speak to that, like, like you said, like a public baseline flow or, you know, what does public trust doctrine really protect? you know, in the central sands. So I think that the number that's been um, thrown around for the, what the public rights flow should be is uh, four cubic feet per second. In, in that's, that's for the Little Plover River specifically. So that, that's the number where they're trying to, to control or manage flows to be at that public rights stage. Um, and I'm not a stream ecologist, but I think that the discussion that's gone into to, setting that number is, has been like, all right, this, this number is what it would take to um, have a healthy stream ecosystem. So that, that's the number that, that I've heard for that particular stream. <laughs>